What's up? This is Chino from Unity and Struggle. Uh, today we're going to do a presentation on fascism and anti-fascism. This photo is a shot of the Sweden Democrats. Uh, they're a descendant of the Nazi party in Sweden, and they're now the most popular party in Swedish parliament. So the term fascism gets thrown around a lot in left circles. Uh, for some people, it refers to a super reactionary form of capitalist dictatorship. Uh, for others, it's just kind of a slur that they use for anyone bad. We want to start by proposing that fascism is best understood as a process that develops over time in periods of capitalist crisis. So this presentation will be in two parts. Part one outlines the basic features of this process, and it draws on historical fascist movements as examples and contemporary ones too, and it briefly measures the Trump phenomenon against this kind of outline. Part two surveys different anti-fascist strategies in history, um, and it offers some basic suggestions for what our strategy might be in the U.S. today. Fascism as a movement tends to be led by sectors of the petty bourgeoisie and, to some extent, the aristocracy of labor. So these might be people who own their own business. Uh, it might be people in a managerial position who direct others' labor power. It might also be really skilled workers who are kind of on the edge of being able to launch their own thing, you know, uh, people who could become independent contractors. Uh, it tends to develop in times of economic or political crisis when these layers whose class position starts to get unstable and threatened develop a kind of anger and resentment at the situation. And they place blame in many directions at once, both on the capitalist class and their representatives in power and other layers of the working class that they resent. The petty bourgeois layers that are involved in a fascist movement could really vary depending on the class composition of the society, its historical development, things like that. So for example, Daniel Gurin in his book Fascism and Big Business outlines a bunch of different petty bourgeois layers that were involved in the development of Nazism. Some were sort of holdovers from previous historical periods like skilled craftsmen, and some were new layers, like mid-level technocrats in the state. So as these fascist movements develop, they tend to draw in other D-class layers toward them, which basically means anyone whose class position, forms of political organization, class identity have kind of eroded and started to come apart in the course of an economic crisis. Right? Unemployed workers former soldiers who are now in public assistance, things like that. And because they attract all these declassed elements from different parts of society, fascist movements tend to be a kind of hodgepodge of different strata bound together, not by a single class interest, but by a unifying ideology and political organization, a fascist ideology, a fascist party. Also important, uh, this process doesn't happen in a vacuum in a single country. Usually, it's kind of spurred forward in a mutually reinforcing way with other nationalist projects and populist projects in other countries as well. It's like a domino effect. When one state goes right-wing and nationalist, they impose policies that heighten tensions and instability internationally, that deepen the economic crisis, and spur forward the conditions for other right-wing developments in other countries. So you can see in this very fancy diagram, we got this pyramid is, uh, you know, class society. It's like a nice layer cake. And here a crisis starts to happen and the different class layers that had been around start to, to break up. And whoop, here goes the petty bourgeoisie off on its own, developing its own understanding of the situation. And here are other broken up D-class layers being pulled toward that movement. So historically, fascist movements develop in these periods of crisis, and they propose to solve the crisis through a reactionary transformation of society. They're like revolutionaries from the right. Now, fascist programs and ideologies can vary really widely, but they usually entail some idea of collective rebirth and transformation, and they often combine forward-looking and backward-looking elements. Forward-looking elements that call for social transformation. A lot of the fascist movements in the 1930s borrowed many elements from socialism, its rhetoric, the idea of nationalizing industry. 
and it combines that with backward-looking appeals to sort of a golden age in the past. They also often rely more on emotional appeals than reasoned arguments about class interests. So, for example, the critical theorist Theodore Adorno says fascism crafts this kind of collective belonging by encouraging people to identify with a demagogue who both embodies the kind of downtrodden, pathetic status that they feel, and at the same time, their narcissistic desire to be powerful and vengeful. Now, this tells us something because communist movements have historically kind of failed to grapple with the role of emotion in politics. The more Marxism as a tradition came to view itself as a rational science of objective class interests, the less Marxists really bothered to think about how emotion and affect plays into people's political commitments. So this challenges us to think about how that's true uh, of any revolutionary movement. Now also, and this is an important part, fascist programs entail not only smashing on the left, but also getting rid of bourgeois democracy as a whole. This includes not only breaking apart workers' organizations, but also getting rid of parliaments, getting rid of uh, rights that have been shrined in the democratic state. Now this photo on the top is an example of emotional appeals. This is the Turkish, now President Tayyip Erdogan. Erdogan actually built a fake Ottoman palace in Turkey to welcome foreign dignitaries, complete with this staircase of sort of Ottoman warriors on the left and right. This is an appeal to a pre-modern capitalist empire, almost a gesture of like, make Turkey great again. The photo on the bottom is a march in the Maldives. It's a demonstration um, in favor of ISIS. You know, the sign rejecting Western bourgeois democracy. Now, another important characteristic of fascist movements is that they develop autonomously from the capitalist class, and often they start out antagonistic with it. Many historical fascist movements describe themselves as anti-capitalist, though by capitalist they usually mean something different than how leftists understand it. Fascists are not simply the hired thugs of capitalists, they're doing their own thing. But this relationship often changes as the fascists become more powerful and as the economic and political crisis in society continues to deepen. So because fascist movements are often really good at physically repressing the left in the streets, the bourgeoisie will sometimes sponsor them, so they might provide funds or politically legitimate attacks on the left, even as they also consider fascists kind of volatile, a liability, and they try to keep them on a leash and even crack down on them also, sometimes. But as the crisis deepens, the capitalist class itself becomes more and more internally divided with disagreements over how to solve the crisis and move forward. So at a certain point, some ruling class sectors will be willing to see the fascists rise to power, thinking, hey, these are the only people that could maybe stabilize this crisis, and also, if the left is strong, they're the only force that might prevent proletarian revolution, even if that means bringing fascists to power who will liquidate some of their fellow capitalists. They're often willing to do it. Italian communist Antonio Gramsci theorized this combination of a rising fascist movement and a ruling class that at a certain moment sort of opens the door. He called this passive revolution, seizing the state from below but without a mass insurrection. And there's actually been no fascist movement that's come to power through a mass insurrection. It's almost always through this passive revolution combination, rising from below and someone up top opening the door. Now, historically, when fascists seize power in this manner, all of a sudden, they find themselves having to manage the capitalist state. And in the process, they often kill off their own left wings, the ones that embrace the more forward-looking, twisted leftist versions of their ideology. This happened in Germany, for example, in the Night of the Long Knives in 1934. The image here on the top is a Nazi election campaign poster. It reads, Marxism is the guardian angel of capitalism. So here you see the fascists being hostile or saying they're hostile to both the left and capitalism. Now, the second image below is Hitler walking next to a German steel industrialist named Fritz Tyson, the guy on the right. Tyson eventually broke with most of his other capitalists to make big donations to the National Socialist Party before it took power. So he was kind of an early adopter of fascism amongst the capitalist class. Based on this outline, we can evaluate the Trump campaign. Unity and Struggle views Trump not as a full-on fascist, but as a kind of individual opportunist who's riding on a right populist upsurge. He doesn't have a real systematized ideology of his own, and he lacks other elements of a fascist movement. 
That said, the class composition of Trump's most committed supporters generally fits the mold of classical fascism. It's people who are on the edge of the aristocracy of labor and the petty bourgeoisie who now feel politically and economically threatened. These could include small, regional or local businessmen, skilled workers, managers. And elements of Trump's campaign also fit. Trump uses largely emotional appeals to popularize this vision of collective rebirth based on going backward to some golden age. That's the whole point of Make America Great Again. But the Trump campaign isn't a fully matured fascist movement yet, since it's still missing some elements of our definition. For example, Trump isn't proposing a revolution from the right in the sense of expropriating the capitalist class or disbanding Congress with emergency powers, even though he is breaking with the acceptable norms of U.S. democracy. Also, Trump's campaign wasn't really bound together by a fascist mass movement or mass organization with a shared ideology, and importantly, so far, his movement lacks a street-fighting force that can smash on the left in the streets. Nevertheless, fascist forces are operating in Trump's base, and they used his campaign, and they're going to use his presidency to reach out to new supporters and legitimate their views and insert themselves as a fighting force in the streets. This could include everybody from the American Nazi Party to the KKK to other groups like the Traditionalist Workers' Party or the Fringe of the Patriot Movement, and of course the alt-right. So depending on how the more general right populist upsurge develops, Trump's campaign could prove an incubator for the development of a mass fascist movement in the United States. You can pause the video here and discuss some of these questions if you find it useful.